All right, welcome to CS 3510. Um, today's topic is going to be on NP complete graph problems. So let's re review the definition of what an NP completeness reduction is, what it means to show a problem to be NP complete. Uh, to show some problem uh, a, uh, some problem B uh, to be uh, NP complete, and again, N B is a set of decision problems. Um, uh, B is NP complete uh, if you can prove one that B is an NP. To prove B is an NP, all you have to do is give a polynomial time verifier. The verifier takes as input the answer to the problem, just simply has to check it. It is allowed to grade it, and the verifier runs in polynomial time. Then you choose some NP complete problem. Uh, Complete problem, problem uh, A, and then you prove there's a polynomial time reduction from A uh, to B. Now, what is the definition again of a polynomial time reduction? Uh, if, uh, if there exists a function uh, such that x is in A, uh, if and only if uh, f of x is in B, and f is computable in polynomial time, you should always be thinking of this picture. You have the good of A, and then you have the bad of A. You have the good of B, and then you have the bad of B. And the reduction uh, takes the good to the good and the bad to the bad. It need not be bijective or surjective or anything like this, but it has to have this property that there's no crisscrossing, right? It need, not even, it need not even be like surjective over B. It just has to go into B at all. The reason for this is this relationship acts as we can relate the hardness or the easiness of A and B together. If B is supposed to be easy, that means A is easy because you can determine A simply by solving for B and computing the reduction. You can, if you can determine between B and not B easily, you just simply compute the transformation and then make that de determination. Um, but if A is thought to be hard, then B has to be hard because otherwise that would make, mean A was easy. So if A is NP complete, that means uh, B is here, by performing this reduction, you've proven that it's NP hard. Um, then to finish the proof that it's NP complete, you simply just show it's an NP. Usually the reduction is a harder uh, thing to do than um, uh, showing it's an NP. Usually showing it's an NP is almost a formality. It's usually the easy way. Most of the problems that you've encountered are in NP, but there do exist some which are NP hard and then not known to be an NP. An example we did was Mario. Mario is not, um, we don't know how to prove it's an NP, uh, but we were able to prove that it was uh, NP hard, at the very least. Like, um, so and then the next question you should have is like, of course, what's, my, what's the NP complete problems that we know to perform the reduction from? So what you start out with was we proved that, we didn't prove, but we said SAT was NP complete. And we said this is by the Cook-Levin theorem. And this proof is not, it's of medium conceptual difficulty, but it's like really hard in the minor details. You basically have to, take the ver polynomial time verifier, and you convert it into a SAT formula, which is very complicated programming. You use the ands and ors and not gates to simulate the entire polynomial time verifier, and you, s you prove you get a polynomial sized formula out. It's kind of involved proof. It takes like 50 minutes. Thankfully, they did it for us, so we don't have to do it. That's sort of the important part. Then we proved uh, that three SAT was NP complete, right? And a quick comment, a lot of people notice that the term reduction seems a little uh, confusing because, I mean, we're not making the problem simpler, usually. Uh, and it's sort of a historical term uh, more than anything. We usually aren't making the problem simpler. Some of the ones on your homework don't appear to be simpler, two-thirds sat and so on, right? They seem more complicated than just sat. So it seems like you're making the problem more complicated. Originally, the first reduction was just to three sat. And three sat, it, you can think of as, as a simplification of sat. Even though it's a restricted variant of sat, it's still just as hard as sat. We proved it was NP-complete. Right. Um, when you do a proof, you don't have to use sat. You can use three sat. That makes the form, that makes the proofs easier, as we'll see today. You usually have like you can say, well, if you don't have three sat, you can say, well, the clauses are of size k, and then something else kind of looks more complicated. Here, by assuming the clauses are of size at most three, turns out things are easier. Then we proved Mario was NP complete, right, from three sat. Um, today, uh, so these are all kind of formula problems, except Mario. Uh, 
Today we're going to prove several graph problems. So we're going to prove from three sat today. We're going to prove a problem called independent set in a graph. Then from independent set, we're going to prove two problems. We're going to prove a problem called vertex cover and a problem called speed cube. So two pictures you should always have in your head at all times. One is this, what the reduction looks like. It's always good to good, bad to bad. Keep that in mind. Two is the sort of tree as we're working through the problems, what it looks like. Sat, three, from sat, everything comes from sat. It's sort of the root of the tree. Three sat is like the useful version of sat. Makes, it, makes proof simpler. Uh, independent set, vertex cover, and clique are all graph problems. So this should, I think, is actually more interesting personally than Mario because um, we did a whole unit on graph algorithms and we actually talked about like the easy graph algorithms. Finding the minimum spanning tree, finding choice paths in a graph, you know, uh, top sort. Um, all these, uh, all pair shortest path. We talked about all these things you can do to graphs and that the graph structure simplifies the algorithm significantly. But now I'm here, I'm claiming that there are some, at least three today, hard graph problems. Now what do we mean by hard graph problem? Is in the sense that, you know, finding the minimum spanning tree and all these, these are easy. Runs in n log n time, whatever. V plus e. Uh, if these problems are proven to be NP complete as we will do today, that means that the fastest algorithms for them, we only know our exponential time. So some people come in with the intuition like, oh, the only problems on graphs are the easy problems. There are no hard problems on graphs. Well, we can prove that there are exist NP complete problems on graphs. Many NP complete problems, it turns out. And uh, we're gonna prove at least uh, these three today. Another quick uh, comment is we'll, is we'll do is, uh, once you've proven a problem to be NP complete, you can use it further. So I, uh, the homework has several like uh, formula problems. So the answer, you have to, ch one of the hardest parts about doing an NP complete problem is choosing the closest problem to reduce from. You don't wanna choose something way too complicated to, for the reduction to be kind of messy. Um, so if you have a formula problem, you're probably gonna choose three sat. It's probably not sat. If you, after today, you'll see if you have the graph problem, you probably will choose one of these three to reduce from. You're not gonna redo uh, the reduction we're doing today. Um, the reduction from three sat to independent set is the hard one. That's the one that will take us a majority of the time today. But then once we've proven that an NP complete problem on graphs exists, then these two follow almost easily, right? So converting graph problem to graph problem, graph problem to graph problem, easy. Converting formula problem to graph problem is hard. You don't have to ever redo that. You know, if we do a reduction in class, basically every reduction is simply a transformation of the proof. Every time you reduce from three sat to something, what you're actually doing is transforming the original proof that Cook and Levin did without even knowing what it is. If you took that proof plus a reduction, it's just simply a transformation of the proof, right? Any questions on the setup before we get into uh, uh, the important part? So what is an independent set? An independent set of some graph G is a selection uh, I, a selection of the uh, vertices uh, such that uh, no two vertices of I share an edge. G. So basically, like you choose a selection of the vertices, and that any every uh, vertice in the independent set, there is no edge between them. So, for example, if I gave you uh, a wheel graph, What's an independent set in this graph? So that's a selection of three of the vertices. I don't know if you need to see the purple, okay. Uh, that's a selection of three of the vertices that had a size three. So that's an independent set of size three. Now as a search problem, we would word this as, we wanna find the maximum independent set. Uh, we'll word this as, a, we'll show you how to word this as a decision problem in just a second. Are there any other independent sets? The independent set you can observe already is not unique. 
Here's another independent set, one, two, three. Um, what other independent sets are there? Well, if you choose the middle node, notice that you can't choose any of the ones on the outer ring. So there is an independent set. Every independent set containing the middle has to be of size one. It's not very maximal. Um, so it looks like you just, the maximal independent set in this graph is you take the outer ring and then you choose even or odd. Uh, thank God it's even, we can split it into two, but if it was like seven on the outside, maybe there's, we'll be missing one, you take the floor of that. So this is an example of an independent set in a graph. Um, what about a bipartite graph? Uh, what is a maximal independent set in a bipartite graph? You guys know what a bipartite graph is, right? A bipartite graph is a graph where you can partition the vertices into two halves such that none of the edges are going between each half. Right. Yep. You'll take the, you'll take the largest side. That's an independent set. And notice again the independent set for every pair of vertices in the independent set, there does not exist an edge between any of them. Right? If we chose any one over here, let's say we chose that one and that one, that cannot be an independent set because they share an edge, for example. Right? So the independent set on certain variants of graphs at least appears um, decidable uh, efficiently. It appears that, like, well, I could probably find a maximal independent set in a graph pretty easily. You know? um, but it turns out that this problem is NP-complete. This is a hard problem, and the best algorithms for this are exponential time, right? Uh, let me formulate this as a decision problem. If we were to formulate this as a, a decision problem, we would call it uh, uh, end set is equal to pairs of encodings of graphs G and some number G, little g, such that G has an end set of size uh, G. So um, now, this is a, seems like a slightly different problem than the search problem. But convince yourself of the search to decision transformation here. If you can find the maximal independent set problem, it's the same thing as being able to perfectly decide this problem right? efficiently. Every graph has an independent set of size 1. We don't really care about that. We're looking for like a largest g, such that uh, every, like, um, by largest independent set, we mean that it has an independent set of size g. Like the number of vertices in I is G, but there is no independent set of size G plus one, right? Consider this, a gra this graph again. Any independent set of size four must contain a edge. So this has no independent set of size four, but it has one of size three. So it's, it's three is maximal in this graph, right? Any questions on the independent set problem? If you, if you gave me a graph, you could probably try and pen and paper find an independent set. Any questions on the definition of the independent set? All right, now let's prove end of the independent set problem is NP complete. To prove the problem is NP complete, you first have to prove that it's in NP, and then you have to prove that it's NP hard. So we're going to prove uh, that independent set uh, is in uh, NP. Uh, uh, let uh, V be a polynomial time verifier. on input. So the input to V is going to be a problem instance, which is going to be G and G, and then the witness. So every time you determine what the, every time you prove a problem to be an NP, you have to make a determination about what the witness is. So here, an, a witness is supposed to be an answer. It has to be an answer that you can check uh, is true or false. You have no idea how the answer was computed. You're simply the auto grader. You're simply in charge of checking that it is a correct answer, or if it's an incorrect answer. So you have to decide on what the answer looks like. I'm going to determine here, what's a good, what's a good witness for this problem? Well, it's a decision problem, so it's going to be A independent set. And we'll check that the set is of size G. So we'll say the witness is going to be uh, a set of vertices V1 to VK. Um, v is going to uh, first, it's going to check uh, that the number of vertices in the witness is equal 
to uh, G. So like this is not only so usually there's lots of little edge cases you have to you have to obsess over. First off, the answer has to be the size that we're trying to solve for. We're trying to prove their not prove. We're trying to determine if there is an independent set of size G. The witness has to be has to be G vertices, right? So first we'll make that check, and then we'll say for each uh, B I B J in uh, W check uh, no edge of vi, vj in e of g. Now, what is the runtime of this? I said you don't have to say the runtime, but sometimes you, it's obvious what the runtime is. We're checking every pair of vertices in the answer, and k is at most the number of vertices in g. So this is going to take n squared, right? Obviously polynomial time. Uh, we did have to have this edge case, though, of checking that the number of vertices was the right size. Because you, here's an example. The verifier has to be correct, right? So if you say, tr if the verifier returns true on an answer that's wrong, then your verifier is wrong. So you could, if you didn't have this check here, you could give it an input of size 1, and it would always return true. So, uh, right. Any questions on showing the problems in NP? Yeah. Yes. In the witness, the number of vertices in the graph is going to be n or something. V, v, the witness here is a selection of the vertices. It's not all the vertices necessarily. It's just the independent set itself. Mm -hmm. G is here, so this is framed as a decision problem. This bracket means like string. Somehow these two objects are encoded as one, as a tuple. So g is a graph ver with the vertices and the edges. Little g is then just a number. And we're trying to determine, given a graph and a number, does this graph ha have an independent set the size of this number? So that's part of the problem. And we need, to, if they say, well, if someone says, well, this is an answer, we first need to check if it's the right size. Then we need to check if it actually is independent. Those are the two checks we do. K is the size of the independent set of the answer. The witness is, someone is claiming I have an answer, we need to just first check it's the right size. Then we check it's independent. Because it could be independent, but not the right size. It wouldn't solve the right problem. More questions on first proving a problem to be an NP? So now we need to prove that it's NP hard. And um, now when you have a graph problem, it's more likely you want to choose a graph problem to reduce from. But you don't know any graph problems yet. Once we've proven a problem in class to be NP-complete, then you can use it in your reductions. We don't have any yet, though. We need to have one genesis graph problem. So we need to prove uh, that there's a reduction from 3SAT to independent set. So first, we need to sort of, uh, we're going to kind of over-explain the structure of how these problems are related, because they don't really seem related at all, right? Uh, a formula is in 3SAT. Um, we want some formula phi to be in 3SAT uh, if and only if some graph uh, and number pair, g, uh, little g, is an independent set. So it's not obvious how you can convert a formula to a graph. Um, but we want to simulate basically the, the structure that the uh, formula has through the way you choose an independent set. Everything is always about choice. And especially in SAT, ch making choices, small local decisions, has cascading effects. If I gave you um, A or X or B and a C or X naught or D, something like this, it's like a sequence of light switches that are always flipping on and off. If you turn on X to satisfy this clause, it turns off um, C, it turns off X naught in this clause. So that implies that C or D must be true, right? So something like this. Um, choosing something forces the decision or the indecision of other things. You cannot have X and not X both be selected. That's a dichotomy. You can't have both. They have to be distinct. And that's sort of obvious to us. You know, true is not, can't both be true and false. But it's important that we mention this out loud because we're going to simulate that property through the graph. 
When you choose uh, x is true, uh, turns off every instance of not x, right? For all uh, literals x and not x, right? We need to somehow, so making a decision in SAT has cascading effects about other decisions that are made in SAT. We need to have something in the graph that simulates this. As you choose variables, to the assignment to be true and false, you will force the decisions of the other variables. We're gonna have the same thing be simulated in the um, independent set algorithm, yeah. Basically, so notice that x being true means not x is false. What we're going to do is basically, if you have a graph, consider this graph. Okay, if you choose x, let's call this x, and let's call these not x. If you choose x, you can't choose any of not x, right? If you choose a vertice, all the vertices adjacent to that cannot be chosen. So that's how we're gonna simulate that. Now this is sort of an informal idea, but it does help with reductions. If you imagine how local changes in the SAT or whatever you're reducing from, if you, if you have a way you think you can simulate those small local changes in your independent set algorithm, then it's the same, right? So what we're gonna do is uh, create a graph G basically based on this. Every time X and X not appear, we're just gonna add an edge between them. So they both can't be in the independent set. That's sort of the idea. So. Uh, let uh, phi be in 3sat. Uh, we give graphs, graph and number, uh, we'll say g and little g. So g is constructed as follows uh, for each clause of G add triangle to the graph for each clause of, excuse me, phi. Now, why am I putting triangle in quotes? So, uh, three sat, we didn't actually mention, because it doesn't matter if it's at most three sat or if it's exactly three sat. And the answer is both of those are NP complete. And I will allow you to assume whichever one is more convenient. Uh, I think like 14 of the 15 books say exactly, say at most three sat, and then one book, which is like the more popular, the most popular book, says exactly three sat. So it seems to be convention. You could probably prove one to the other really easily by padding, right? Um, so we're gonna add a triangle to the graph, but a triangle for a clause of size two is going to be, um, a line and a clause of size one is just gonna be a node, right? A, a triangle with two points is just a line. It'll, this is one of those that'll make more sense as we do the picture, we do an example. Um, uh, for X in each triangle, add edge to not X in each other triangle. And that's basically it. So I have to give you an example of this. Um, consider the formula x on, excuse me, not x or, uh, or y or not z and x or not y or z uh, and x uh, or uh, y or z and then we'll do x, not x, and not y. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a triangle per clause uh, it's gonna look like this. We'll put X here, excuse me, not X. We'll put Y here, and we'll put Z here. We'll put uh, X, uh, not Y, 
and z uh, here. Uh, x, uh, y, z. And then finally we have not x and then not y. Now this is supposed to be quote unquote a triangle. This is the tr quote unquote triangle for a clause of length two. You can imagine if I, if I had a clause of length one, I would just add a single node. So you create one triangle per clause, yes? Yes, thank you, thank you. Now for each x in each clause, we're gonna add an edge to not x. What does that look like? Uh, well, y and not y, here we're going to add an edge. Um, y and not y. Y and not y. Um, and then one goes here. Z and not z. Um, z and not z. X and not x. Um, x and not x. Uh, x and not x, and then x and not x. Okay, did I miss any? Double check that for me. Every y that appears in one clause is connected to the not y's that appear in all other clauses, right? I think that's all the edges. Now, uh, simply drawing a graph is not a proof. We need to do the reduction. But the reduction, uh, before you do the reduction, it should become more obvious how the reduction is going to work, right? So we have, um, if you think about, oh, and, we'll s and then we have one more thing. We have to set, uh, uh, set uh, g to be equal to the number of clauses of phi. Then you're going to return uh, this graph g and this number g, right? Now, um, first off, does the reduction take polynomial time? Computing the reduction has to take polynomial time. So you take as input a formula phi with, you may suppose, n literals. Does this take polynomial time in the size of the formula phi, which is the input? The answer is yes. So each clause has a it takes constant time per clause to make a triangle. And then wiring it up can take, at worst case, like n squared, right? The graph is still a polynomial size with respect to the formula. So writing gr the, the graph down is not that hard, right? Um, it's hard to measure the actual runtime uh, of stuff like this, but it clearly is a polynomial time reduction, right? We just need to prove that it is a reduction. So what we're going to do is we're going to first prove that if phi is in 3 sat, then uh, g comma g is in independent set. Another thing to note here, uh, this proof could easily generalize to doing a reduction from sat instead of 3 sat, but the proof would just be worse. Do you agree? What would this look like had you chosen sat to reduce from instead of 3 sat? You wouldn't, have get, you wouldn't get to assume that the clauses are of size 3, and you wouldn't get to say triangle. You would have to say something else. You have to say a clique of size three, uh, excuse me, a clique of size k if the clause is of size k. Um, so this triangle would be, you know, uh, something much uglier. And then it's like, well, what's the size of the graph? Does it take polynomial time? I don't. I mean, it's, you know, uh, something gets complicated. I have all these numbers going around. Um, that's why assuming three sat is a much simpler problem to reduce from. Always better to choose three sat to reduce from. Um, all right, now what we need to do is we want to prove, given this formula phi, we want to prove that this graph has an independent set of size g. Since phi is in 3 sat, uh, there exists uh, a satisfying assignment. Assignment. Uh, uh, to phi, right? So we take the answer to the formula phi, and we're going to suggest that there must exist an answer, uh, an independent set of size g. Uh, each clause has uh, at least one literal 
uh, set to true. Choose one uh, such literal per triangle in uh, G. Since there are uh, little g clauses, this is an independent set of size uh, little g. So we see that g comma g is in independent set. Right. So quick remarks. First off, the solution does not transform exactly, just kind of most of the way. A clause can be turned on by more than one literal. So we're saying just take one of those literals that are turned on and add it to our independent set. So for example, if x, if x was false, then in a satisfying assignment, then in our independent set, add not x, right? If uh, z was on, in our independent set, choose z, right? You're going to choose one uh, per clause. Now, why is this an independent set of size g? Well, there are g triangles because there are g clauses. Each clause is turned on in with it l at least one literal, maybe more than one. But you're going to choose one element per clause. That's going to be an independent set, exactly the number size of the number of clauses, which happens to be g. So we see, we see that if the formula was satisfiable, then this graph has an independent set of size g. Agree? Any questions on, on just the first way of the reduction? So uh, th if the formula has a solution, this graph has an independent set of a certain size. That's all we're saying right now. We haven't done the reverse direction yet. But we're saying that if the formula has a solution, then this graph has an independent set of size g. We'll prove if the for formula has no solution, then there's no independent set of certain size. Right? Yes? It, this is the gr this is G, yeah. That's all of G. Ah, uh, no, we construct G. So we, you're given the formula, and then we output G. The for the reduction takes as input a formula and outputs a graph and a number G, little G. So given the formula, we write down the graph. So this graph is written down by us, taking an input the formula. It's the reduction. Notice though, like you can only choose one per triangle. For in, in any independent set of this graph, allows you to only choose one per triangle. Yeah. I will allow you to assume whichever one is more convenient because the books are, it doesn't really matter. The, there's not a like consensus, there's like a 99% consensus, but that's good enough to, it, you should prove as an exercise by reduction that they're both, there's a reduction one way or the other. You can go from uh, assuming one is NP hard to proving the other is NP hard and so on. It's not too hard. One is done by padding and one is done almost trivially because exactly three sat is also at most three sat, right? Reduction is tr tr trivial in that sense. Every exactly three sat formula is also an at most three sat formula. So, yeah. Yes. Ah, literal set to true, not variable. And a literal is a claw is a variable or its negation. So what I mean by that is n not y or not x is true. So x or y is 0. Yeah. This is only the first half of the proof. Now, when you want to do that, you have to do a reduction always has two steps. Uh, we're going to do proving the second way. There's actually two ways you can do it. Uh, and you want to choose the one that's easier. What, in, what I'm going to do instead of usually you say in implies in and then not in implies not in. Instead, we're just going to do the reverse. We're going to say uh, let uh, g comma g be an independent set. To show the infinite only if, we're simply going to show that the formula that it was transformed from has a satisfying assignment. That's all we're going to say, right? Uh, and now, by the way, g here is not going to be a general graph in independent set. It's going to be the graph explicitly constructed from a formula phi, uh, where uh, f of phi 
is equal to this g comma g. Like, it's the output of the reduction and not a general graph number pair. Um, uh, then uh, g has an independent set of size g. No uh, independent set uh, of g can uh, has two vertices in one triangle, right? So if this graph has an independent set, uh, whatever that independent set is of size g, there cannot be two vertices selected in the independent set in the same triangle. Why is a triangle? You, if you choose one element of the triangle, the other two elements are off limits. It's not an independent set if you choose two of the same triangle. Um, so uh, the ind independent set of size G has exactly one selected uh, node per triangle. Uh, we're almost done. You should probably be able to finish the conclusion. This corresponds exactly uh, to a set of literals to satisfy phi. So we see that phi is satisfiable. Questions on the reverse re reduction? Do we see what happened? If this has an independent set of size g, and there's g triangles, and you can't have two in the same triangle, there has to be one chosen per triangle. That happens to correspond exactly to which literals you'll, you'll turn on in the formula. Questions on the reduction? You see how the proof was set up? There's a, it goes one way and it goes the other way, right? This is sort of what's expected. Um, Quick comment we can make about uh, the proof. So we've proven the problem is NP hard, uh, and we've pro proven the problem is NP in NP, so the problem is uh, NP complete, right? You're, when you're trying to prove a reduction from A to B, you're proving that X is in A if and only if. Uh, f of x is in b, and f of x is computable in polynomial time. Uh, there's two ways to do this. One, you can prove that x is in a implies x is in b, and that x is not in a implies uh, f of x, oops, f of x is not in b. That's a more classic way to prove an if and only if. You can also prove that x is in a implies uh, f of x is in b, and that if f of x is in b, that implies that x is an a, right? Which one you'll do is up to you. Which one you can kind of think is easier? Yes. Exactly. I just did this one. I said, well, let f of x be in b. So let suppose it does have an independent set of size g. Then the formula had to have a satisfying assignment, right? And uh, this one, it depends on what problem you're actually doing. Sometimes this one is easier. Saying this one, we would have said, for example, the formula is satisfiable. We would have to argue that no independent set of size g exists in the graph. That's what, and that's a slightly more cumbersome argument, I think, for this specific reduction. But those, sometimes that direction is easier. You get to choose between these. Uh, final note is that this actually, if you think about it, this doesn't really prove the hardness of independent set in general. It proves hardness of independent set on graphs that look like compositions of triangles in this way. So we converted all SAT formulas to some specific graphs, right? There are some special cases of graphs where independent set is easy. There might be special cases of graphs where independent set is even harder. But we said, um, you know, this special case turns out to be NP complete. Now, why does that say something about the general problem of, NP com of 
independent set and not just, why didn't we say this special case of independent set is NP complete? The reason is, is it still splits. If anyone can tell you can solve independent set in the general case, then they can solve SAT for you. Even though you are mapping SAT to a special case of the graphs, it doesn't matter. If someone says, I can, I can tell you the maximal independent set in a graph, then you could trick them into solving SAT formulas for you. Just because the, the graphs of these special cases are still graphs, um, it's not necessarily true that this special case is the only NP-complete problem, but all of independent set is NP-complete, right? Any more questions on the proof? We understand uh, we have an NP-complete graph problem now that'll make some reductions easier. Yes. Ah, so um, it doesn't. That's something. But the theory doesn't matter. For the theory, it doesn't matter. Suppose someone told you, we proved that um, if there's a polynomial time reduction uh, from A to B and B is in P, then that implies that A is in P. Right? So if someone tells you, I can solve the independent set problem in the general case really efficiently, you could say, OK, you could still trick them into solving SAT for you. They might be able to solve much more than SAT. That's OK. But they could, you could still trick them into solving SAT. And SAT is NP complete. So you could trick them into solving all of NP for you in polynomial time. So P equals NP still. Right? It doesn't matter that there are easy cases or hard cases of independent set. It's still the fact that you reduce to a special case of independent set. The general case must still be hard. It's one of the beautiful parts about the theory. You get to study graphs of a certain structure, it says something about the whole class. That's one of the great parts. All right. More questions on this before we get to the next uh, reduction? All right, let's do clique. So what is a clique in a graph? You may know. Uh, a clique is something that looks like this. Uh, K1 is a single node. Well, something like that. Uh, K2 is an edge. K3 is a triangle. K4 is this thing. Uh, K5 Uh, K6, okay, something like this, right? So the definition of a clique is that every pair of vertices shares an edge. A clique is the most dense graph. A clique is a complete graph. Every pair of vertices share an egg, edge. I always think looking at the picture of a clique is much clearer than uh, saying, you know, every pair of vertices share a graph. Because they always have these nice sort of symmetrical properties. You guys could probably, if I, now that you know the definition of a clique, uh, like if I asked you to draw a clique of size 7, you could probably do it. It would take you, how many edges are in a clique of size k? Because uh, let's say you have a clique of size n, how many edges are there in a clique of size n? O of n squared, but uh, what's, is there, isn't there an exact number? It's v choose 2, which is like n times n plus 1 over 2, I think. Something like that, or maybe it's minus 1. Anyway, O of n squared edges. Now, clique is a NP-complete problem. Um, let's formulate this as a decision problem. So as a decision problem, we'll say graphs and numbers G, such that G has a clique of size G. Okay. Here by a graph having a clique, we mean that there is a subgraph, there's a selection of the vertices you can choose such that 
that graph, every pair of vertices in that selection of nodes has an edge between the two of them. Right? This is really related to a problem we've already seen. Right? Do you guys see? This one I think is a little almost trivial. What is the relationship between this problem and independent set? Without thinking, so we proved a reduction from three sat to clique, excuse me, from independent set. But you can forget that. Now that we know independent set is, don't forget it, but you can think about, you don't have to think about three sat at all. We're going to prove a reduction from independent set to clique. So I claim that there's a very simple structure. Unlike the reduction from three sat to independent set, which was sort of a complicated proof, I claim this proof is almost trivial. It's like you can wave a wand, it's going to be easy. What is the structure between independent set and clique? Mm -hmm. Exactly. A clique is just the opposite of an independent set. What is the definition of an independent set? An independent, a set is independent if no edges are between them. A set is a clique if every edge is between them. So those are the same thing, basically. So what we're going to do is define something called a graph complement. So if we do, um, consider this following graph. Right? Now we could, now what's the largest clique in this graph? Uh, I'm not seeing a clique of size four, but I am seeing a clique of size three. So three is, a, is a, maybe the largest clique here. Every graph has a clique of size one or two. If it has a single edge, it's got a clique of size two. Three is just a triangle. Four is that thing, right? Um, the graph complement will define as um, the graph is the vertices and the edges. We'll define the graph complement to be the complement of the set of edges. So we'll say V and then E complement. For every edge that is in G, there is not an edge in the graph complement. And for every non-edge in G, there is an edge in the graph complement. So if I were to draw this, I'll put the same edges there. And then for every edge that's there, I won't draw an edge. And then for every edge that is, isn't there, I'll draw an edge. All right, so that's the graph complement. What do we know about that? What is that? That's a loop, that's a cycle. That's a cycle of length six. It's just organized in a weird way. It's kind of, graph complements are fascinating stuff. There are some graphs which are their own complements. Uh, this is kind of interesting because this is kind of a neat shape, but you would not think that the complement of, of this graph would be a loop. This is, turn, that's, turns out that's true. So graph complement um, is that. Now, given the graph complement, this does not have a clique of size two, more than two. There's no triangles in here. But it does have an independent set of size three, right? Consider the exact same set of vertices, the exact same solution. Notice that there are no edges between those three vertices because there were edges between those three vertices in the graph. And in fact, the complement of the complement is just the original graph. So we get a very easy reduction here between clique and independent set. And in fact, between independent set and clique even. We'll do the proof the correct way though. Any questions on the structure before we get into some of the, 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 the detail? In class, we're gonna do mostly the hard reductions. So you have NP complete problems to work with, like the independent set. Um, this is a, uh, like from three set to independent set, challenging reduction. This one is fairly easy. Uh, so first we're gonna show that clique is in NP. Uh, we give poly time verifier uh, V 
on input, the problem is going to be graph G and a number G, and the witness is going to be what? What's the witness to a, verifi a polynomial time verifier for cleat? Yes. So we'll choose a set of vertices. Well, we won't choose it. The, somehow it's given to us. Um, we're going to check. It's basically the same verifier for independent set. We're going to check that k is equal to g. Then for each uh, vi, vj in uh, w, ensure edge uh, vi, vj is in e of g. So first you're going to ensure that the clique is of the right size. Someone is claiming to you that I found a clique in this graph G of size G. Well, first you're going to check that it's the right size. Then you're going to check that every pair of vertices has an edge. Again, this runs in quadratic time. Uh, a polynomial time verifier, we prove the problem is an NP. Questions on the proving the problem is an NP? A little mechanical, almost. The reduction for this one, far easier. The reduction in polynomial time is simply going to reverse the graph. F of on input g comma g is going to output um, uh, g complement comma g, such that uh, g comma g is an in independent set. Uh, if and only if we want to prove this, uh, g complement comma g is in clique. Right. We want to show a reduction from independent set to clique. That's easy. Why does the reduction take polynomial time? Flip the edges takes e steps, right? Yes. Uh, this is the reduction. The reduction takes as input a problem from independent set is going to output a problem in clique. Right? So the reduction is, is never a solution. It's always a transformation. So we're transforming a problem in independent set to a problem in clique to preserve that we want to show that the reduction will preserve the correctness. Good goes to good, bad goes to bad. Right? Any questions on how the reduction works here? It's pretty simple. Independence, uh, uh, three sets to independent set, kind of complicated. Uh, we got to make these clauses and we got to do all these triangles. Here you just flip the graph. It's pretty simple, right? Uh, now we need to prove that uh, this reduction is correct. It works in polynomial time, obviously. So let's prove it's correct. Uh, let uh, g comma g uh, be in uh, independent set. Uh, so uh, there is a set i subset of v of size g which shares no edges in uh, g uh, but by definition of graph complement This set I shares uh, every edge in G complement. This is the definition of a clique. So a G complement has clique of size g, so g complement comma g is in clique. OK. Forward direction, pretty simple. Questions on that? The 
Let's do the reverse direction. Yes. I is the clique, it's uh, the independent set itself. So, uh, so there is a set I subset of D. So we want to prove that if uh, G complement G has an independent set, excuse me, has a clique, then G complement G uh, had an independent set of size G. So. Uh, if G complement G has a clique, there is a set I subset of V um, uh, such that, oh, excuse me. This reverse direction, reduction is actually going to be too easy. It's basically the same. Um, every, uh, pair of vertices uh, of I uh, share an edge and I is of size G. Then consider uh, excuse me, uh, I in G, uh, every pair of vertices share no edge. Uh, by definition of graph complement, This is an independent set of size G in V, in, excuse me, in G. So uh, G comma G is an independent set. We've proven the problem is in NP. We gave a reduction. We showed that it was an if and only if. We can conclude that clique is exactly as hard as uh, independent set. They're both NP complete problems. Any questions on this proof? Yes. What is what? Want to show. Yeah. Statement we're trying to prove. More questions? Reduction, this reduction is fairly simple. Most reductions will look like this one. This one is a, the simplest reduction I could think of, but most of them will be around this difficulty, right? You won't have things like sat independent set, as we saw. All right, let's do one more graph problem. A vertex cover is a selection of the edges uh, such that every subset, every node of G sh shares an endpoint with the cover. So now we're not choosing a set of vertices, we're choosing a set of edges. And we want a set of edges in some sense that's spanning. We want a set of edges, uh, by the way, minimum spanning tree is a vertex cover. It's not the best vertex cover, but it's always a vertex cover. We want a set of edges such that every vertice shares an endpoint with um, an element in the graph. 
So consider a clique of size 4. Now we don't want the largest vertex cover. Every graph has a vertex cover of the number of nodes, right? So you can always find the largest vertex cover. We want actually to find the smallest vertex cover. We want the fewest set of edges that you can choose such that every node covers those edges, right? What is a vertex cover of this graph? Um, what is the max, what is the fewest number of edges that you can select? Yeah, two would cover, two, a vertex cover would be, uh, that would work too, but I was thinking this one. A vertex cover of size two would cover every vertex in that, right? Consider this graph. Oh, my bad. I got the problem mixed up. Uh, a vertex cover is not a selection of the edges. It's a selection of the vertices. I think this is a different homework problem. You want a selection of the vertices that cover every edge. So given that, what is the selection of the vertices of a clique that covers every edge? Uh, well, this is just for the case of a clique. Let's solve it. Let's solve it. In, let's solve vertex cover in a couple cases. We want a selection of the vertices such that every edge has an endpoint in this in the cover, right? Every edge is adjacent to a selection. Yeah. Not necessarily true because the crucible algorithm returns a spanning tree. And you don't, there are, I think that's dangerous because the problem is NP-complete. And you're suggesting a polynomial time algorithm for something I'm 95% sure is, there is no polynomial time algorithm for it. So just intuition-wise, intuition I'd be willing to bet that you take the spanning tree algorithm, remove some edges, something might go wrong. It would be greedy, and that might almost work, but I don't know if that would guarantee a minimum vertex cover, right? What is the fewest set of edges, fewest set of vertices in this graph you can select? Three. Right. Every edge shares an endpoint with that set. In general, for a clique of size n, what is the smallest set of vertices you can choose uh, such that every edge shares an endpoint. N minus one, right? So, uh, cliques have really large vertex covers, right? What about this graph? What is the fewest set of vertices you can choose such that every edge has an endpoint, right? Two, you could choose the middle one, and that would cover all these edges. Great, but then notice that this edge is not covered by your middle one, so you're forced to make a decision here, right? So choosing a vertex cover, you may not want to choose adjacent vertices because, well, that edge has already been covered if they're adjacent. But sometimes you may have to, right? Here you have to choose a, a, a adjacent vertices, yes. We need a vertex cover. So we, every edge has to be connected to an endpoint. So that edge has to be covered, right? Vertex cover, you wouldn't believe it, is NP-complete. I'll just call it BC, so I don't have to keep writing that. Uh, G and a number G, such that uh, G has a vertex cover of size G, right? So what should the reduction be? Like, what do we think we know about a vertex cover, right? If, what is the relationship between vertex cover and either clique or independent set. So you have a graph problem. We're trying to prove this problem is NP-complete. We need to relate the problem to a known graph problem. So choose clique or choose independent set. I have the foresight to know we're gonna choose independent set, right? So what is the relationship between this problem and uh, independent set? We related clique to independent set by transforming the graph, but it's not necessary you have to do that. There, there are other things you could transform. You have this number G here you can transform. You can transform the problem itself. 
uh, the solution, like the literal independence set, right? So what do we know about uh, a vertex cover? If every, what do we, what, do, what is the relationship between an independent set and a vertex cover? In the vertex cover, not necessarily true because here you had to choose one. Well, starting, that's, that, that implies you're trying to, so we're not trying to ever solve the problem. That's a greedy solution to the, to the problem. We're trying to prove it's NP complete though. So such algorithm shouldn't work, right? In theory at least, yeah. Yeah, exactly. If, if I of G uh, of B is a vertex cover of size uh, G, uh, then I complement is, if every edge touches the set of vertices in I, no edge touches the set of vertices in I complement. So I complement is a independent set. of size, what is the size of the, of the independent set? Yeah, we'll just say size of V minus G, which is N, right? So this graph has an independent set of size G if and only if it has a vertex cover of size N minus G, right? Here's the reduction. We'll take as input G and G and we'll output the same graph but then a vertex cover of a different size. That's it. Let's prove, uh, let's, let's do all the proof, but you see the reduction, you see how this, this, the structure is mirrored. First we prove uh, vertex cover is in NP. Any questions on, on the transformation about why, why that's correct when something is or isn't a vertex cover? Right, why the complement of the vertex cover solution? We didn't complement the graph, we complemented the solution itself, right? First we prove that vertex cover is in NP. Uh, we give poly time verifier. V, so that V on input uh, a graph and a number and our witness is going to be a set of vertices, V1 to VK. Uh, first, uh, check that the vertex cover is of the claimed size. Then we're going to check um, for each edge For each edge uh, uh, E in E, check one endpoint is in W. This, uh, you loop over the number of edges, takes linear time even, right? Polynomial time verifier, uh, pretty simple. Um, questions on the proving it's an NP? Let's, uh, our reduction is this. So we're going to, uh, we want to show that there's a polynomial time reduction from independent set to uh, vertex cover. It would be incorrect for us to go from vertex cover to independent set because we haven't proved vertex cover is NP complete yet. The one on the left is the one that you're gonna choose to be uh, NP complete. So we want to prove that uh, G comma G is in independent set if and only if uh, G comma uh, V minus G is in uh, vertex cover, right?
we were reducing from independence at two vertex cover. These two reductions we've done for clique and vertex cover turns out a bi-directional. Yeah, only for these though are they bi-directional, right? But it, 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 n minus n minus g is going to be g. Yeah. Um, right. So first, let uh, uh, g comma g be in independent set. Uh, so there is a set I of B uh, with no shared edges between them. Notice then um, I complement uh, has one end of every edge. Uh, so is a vertex cover of size uh, b minus g. So uh, g comma g, uh, excuse me, g comma v minus g is in vertex cover, done. Uh, let uh, g comma v minus g be in a vertex cover, then uh, G has a cover I subset of V of size of V minus G, then I complement is independent in uh, G and has size of V minus V minus G, which is equal to G. So um, G comma G was in independent set. We've proven that it's in NP, we've proven that it's NP hard, vertex cover as hard as uh, sat, as hard as three sat, as hard as clique, as hard as vertex cover, as hard as Mario. So all these problems have the same difficulty. All right, that's all I have.